It feels like we're Chef Julian Slowick right now because we are roasting Chef Julian Slowick. That's right. Brunch. Hit it, boys. A uniquely now thing is that when a movie that everybody saw, or that we saw at least, in theaters hits HBO Max or On Demand or whatever, there's a whole new wave of recourse. Or talking di- about discourse, the menu. I'm sorry about it. Yes. Are yeah. you seeing everybody yeah. talking about the menu? Yeah. Crazy. And now I, I, I'm participating in it. I've been uh, doing less tweeting, which just means I've been doing more texting. Okay. And I'm still like tweeting a little, but I'm... Um, I'm more like replying to tweets and less kind of uh, like, look at me, I'm tweeting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's mostly, we've discussed this, if I'm like under the weather or bored in any way. And right yeah. now I famously should be the most bored I know, I've ever been. I know, how's unemployment going? Uh, oh my God, I love it so yeah. much. And uh, like talk to me in three days, <laughs> but it's kind of beautiful. Tell me about Obviously, it. Obviously there's the whole like, I should like probably get health insurance. Should get some money, like things like that. But um, but you've got like a six month grace period where you're allowed to be like I'm enjoying this. Then after a certain point, I think you have to really be like, all right, time to get a job. Yeah, and I'm not going stir crazy. And I'm also kind of you've gone through. You went through this once, uh, like in earnest, and then you went through a like changing jobs. You knew what was going to be next. So it's just like taking a little time off between well, jobs. I mean, the f- the first time that it happened when I was laid off, it was obviously like shitty. Yeah. But it it turned into like the best summer of my life. Right. But so like the next time that it, that I changed jobs, I was like I would like at least like a month off because that was the best time of my life. Yeah. So yeah, like unemployment can be fucking awesome. I don't know, but I'm also You're allowed to enjoy it. I'm also aware that I'm in the honeymoon stage of it, mm-hmm. which is uh it's it's a like an oddly flattering time because that's like when uh and I I I know in your case the first time around you were like all right here's here are the things that I'd like to do I'm going to try to explore those things and if they don't happen then I'll just kind of hang out and wait for the right thing. Yeah, right. I was and, in no rush. Yeah. And this is I guess maybe kind of like that like I know uh I have a plan and I know how I'd like to execute it. But in the meantime, it's kind of nice to, uh, I guess, like announce that you're done with a job. And then a few places are like, oh, hey, you ever think of doing this? You ever think of doing that? Agency. And even if you have it, I don't know, it's just very like you kind of bat your eyes at some people and you say, mm, maybe. <laughs> I mean, there are you, in sports. You know that there are like some people that really enjoy free agency, and you can kind of tell. Yeah. Then there are some people that are like, no, 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 lock me up for as long as possible. Yeah. But this menu discourse, man, it got me. It made me rewatch the menu, and I didn't love the menu initially. I had very high hopes for it, mm-hmm. and the only thing that I really learned from it was that Hong Chao is awesome because. We already knew that Ray Fiennes was going to murder that role, which he did. And everybody was kind of okay in those roles. Anya Taylor-Joy, uh, Nicholas Holt. Is that, yes, that, that my guy's name? Yeah. But that movie just wasn't that great. But it's just wild seeing everybody now, months later, see the menu and all be like, what the fuck was that movie? So the main response for you has been like, what the fuck is this movie? Because I've seen a lot of people say like, Whoa, you got to see this movie. Someone I really respect posted their letterbox thing and was like, wow, this movie is it. And we stand Hong Chao. And I responded and I was like, love how correct you are half of with, with that, half of with that. Yeah, like <laughs> like the, the reason that we were so excited to see the menu is like, I feel like why a lot of people are saying that they love it. But like it didn't deliver on expectations for me and maybe the expectations were a little bit too high but i think we both had like the same mindset going into it where it was like okay this movie seems like it's like very artistic very unique 
some like crazy shit is going to happen. And it's like an A24 type movie. Mm -hmm. And we both came away from it being like, oh, no, that was just like a, a artsy fartsy Blumhouse movie. Right. It was way more Blumhouse than anything else. It was like a Blumhouse version of Chef. And even like not all the food even looked amazing in it. But the biggest takeaway I remember when we first saw it was this movie isn't nearly as smart as it thinks mm -mm. it is. And on watching it a second time, the big laugh that I got out of it uh, the first time was when John Leguizamo's character is kind of begging for his life and uh, and uh, Julian Slowick is like, oh, no, man, you made that movie and I hate that movie. It was my only day off in like months and I watched it. So you got to go. And he was like, fine. But what about her, his assistant? And he asks, where'd you go to college? She says, oh, Brown. Yeah. And he says, student loans? She's crying. She's, no. I'm sorry, you're dying. The first time I saw that, I laughed. But even since seeing that movie, my eat the rich movie fatigue is reaching such a fever pitch that I was like, that could be a really good person. But you, who you just, don't kill her. Yeah, yeah. You don't kill the person. Like a person not having student loan debt does not automatically make them a bad person. Yeah. And maybe she's like, well, I did have student loans and I started this company and then I sold the company yeah. and I uh, paid my student loans. But then I also donated all this stuff. Like Julian Slowick. That's a, that's a shoddy character. Him. It was really not good. Yeah, like the the entire movie had like those moments for me where it's just like, what, what, like what message are you trying to send right now? You know who else catches a big stray in that movie? A huge stray. Who? The s'more. The s oh, that's right. Because yeah. he says it is like the it's like the ultimate abomination. offense yeah. on uh the the like the senses. Like, uh, what does he say? He's like, whatever the 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 opposite of fair trade would be yeah like he, just like he, shitty he, chocolate sugar water and uh like, like store brand crackers yeah and he's and he, he's like it's the worst tasting thing but it's associated with innocence i and mean i'm like you're the one yeah. dressing up people in like s'more jackets dude <laughs> and like have you ever eaten a s'more my my guy s'mores Pretty are pretty good, good. <laughs> s'mores are good i never like I'm never housing s'mores. Yeah. Right. But like it's 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 a fucking treat. It's the same as like a dessert. Yeah. Like it's just if if anybody came to me with that take, like s'mores are like the ultimate offense to to culinary art, I'd be like, oh dude, fuck you. I would say that tells me kind of all I need to know. Here. Exactly. Yeah. I'd be like, oh dude, fuck you. Like enjoy stuff. I'd once be in like, a while. so let me guess. Chicken parm sandwich. Also doesn't do it for you, especially like right after the like the the or I guess I, yeah it was after the the burger thing like the whole like I just want to make people happy. It's like I mean yeah like a burger is probably a, a like a harder culinary thing to do than a s'more, but s'mores make people happy, and Man. it's like a, it's something that tastes great. What like what's the separation there? It feels like we're Chef Julian Slowick right now. Because we are roasting Chef Julian Slowick. That's right. He famously kills himself <laughs> uh, by lighting himself on fire. By the way, the uh, the KYS scene in the that movie doesn't feel any better the second time around. <laughs> I was so mad watching that scene. I, I didn't know that it was going to culminate in that. Yeah. But it's all like, oh, you're a big foodie. Why don't you cook us a dish? That was such like, a tough scene. He didn't say that he was a chef. Yeah. And then he makes it the, the, oh my God. I did find it uh, pretty funny when he like gives him the jacket and he's like, here you go. I'm going to mm -hmm. customize it. And he writes Tyler on it. I mean, the... The like ninety percent of that scene is like kind of funny, yeah. where it's just he is like he's just absolutely mocking this guy, and like ba it's basically like he's just making this guy's dreams come true, and he just, you just know that he's gonna f like just completely ruin him, and so it's painful, but it is funny. Again, though, that's but like, you're right that like the message again, the messaging of this movie is so stupid and so confusing. It's incorrect. Yeah, I, I, I mean, maybe if you want to do this to like an Anthony Fantano type, whatever. But like, say Billy Joel came up to me and he was like, "Hey, Mr. Music Aficionado, <laughs> <Yeah>. sit, <laughs> play, 
play something that will be as good as what I play. I'd be like, I never say that. I, I say that I describe how your music is good. That doesn't, that, that is definitely not saying that I can do what you do. Yeah. And I mean, you can say that something isn't great w- w- without saying I could do it better. Oh, Kayvon Thibodeau did that the other day. You hear that? No. He did. He did the whole like, uh, until you guys have played, you don't know what you're talking about. Starting a narrative at all, and they were, but they were asking him about a comment that Jeff Saturday made, and they were oh, like, yeah, "Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff Saturday is like yeah. a 14 time Pro Bowl." But Jeff Saturday uh, did play, yeah. and uh, we're asking what you think of this thing, and he was like, "I don't know who Jeff Saturday is." <laughs> yeah, I did see that actually. Which that's kind of good, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's, I wish he was like, dude, he's a fucking center. I uh, like you. You want me to keep track of centers all day? Yeah, but I mean, it's. Je- I mean, if it was anybody else, like if there is one center that you know, it's Jeff Saturday. Yeah, M- largely because his name is Jeff Saturday. Yeah, um, I, I, I feel bad for this being the only football talk we'll do in in this podcast. But man, more and more, you're hearing people say, "Watch out for the Chargers." They're like they're. There may be some smoke. There may be some fire, and there may be some some bolts just crashing down on the AFC right now. You you and Kellen have tried very hard to get me t- uh, onto Chargers fandom for the past, I don't know, like month or two. Yeah. And I've denied it. I've denied it. I've denied it. I've just completely shut that out. It's not for me until I saw that little youngster take his shirt off and start spinning it like a helicopter around his head. And then, and then Cameron Dicker, after the game, meeting up with him in the parking lot and taking his shirt off and doing it with him like an absolute fucking goober. <laughs> if, <laughs> Cameron Dicker is like the definition of a goober. And, oh, yeah. And I love every second of it. But we were discussing this. It seems like he's in on it because he's got like the 1970s like feathered hair and everything. <laughs> he... He has to kind of be in on it. He definitely like plays up the doofy, I think. After his first game winning kick, uh, they did one of those things where like they give the player the phone and he's like, Hey, what up, social media? What up, Chargers fans? Well, <laughs> his was like, Hey Bolt fam, Cameron Dicker here. Just won the game for the team. <laughs> Have a good day. He might legitimately be my favorite NFL player. Doing like they're like, oh, like felt cute, might win a game. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I will buy a Chargers Cameron Dicker jersey. I almost did. I famously already have one. Mm. I mean, there you would have be a Texas s- one. It would yeah. be so funny if we went to a Chargers game and I wore the Cameron Dicker Texas jersey and you wore a Chargers jersey with Cameron Dicker. You know what they would think? That we're Cameron Dicker's family. That we're Cameron Dicker's family. <laughs> yeah, because nobody else would do that. Back, back when I used to be a real ace reporter, I'd always be able to uh, find. Uh, players families and a trick i used was if everybody was wearing the same shirt and the shirt all said the same thing such as like mcquaid (laughs) and had like big black hair it's a pretty good bet i'd be like watch this are you related to adam mcquaid (laughs) nailed it uh I bet that if we went to a Chargers game, we wore two Cameron Dicker jerseys, we took a photo in them, and then tweeted it at the Chargers, there's like a 1 million percent chance that we would meet Cameron Dicker after the game. I mean... Unless he like blew a a game-winning kick and like their season ended. I think... I'm not going to initiate this challenge, but if you gave me 10 hours... I'd be able to set up a meeting with Cameron Dicker. <laughs> it's probably true. Like I could get us Cameron Dicker. Yeah, yeah, probably. I actually got a little, got a little miffed. All right, One check the, out next week when Cameron Dicker's on the podcast. Should that be the challenge? We should get Cameron Dicker on the podcast. Cameron Dicker on the podcast next week. Yeah, we've we we've gone a long time without like a a guest challenge. Yeah. All right. I. I should I guarantee that Cameron Dicker's on the podcast next week? Yeah, let's guarantee it. All right, we're, we'll guarantee Cameron Dicker next week. But uh, somebody, well, one of the, I, I, I'm blocking people now more on Twitter, which I'd never really done before, but I'm, I'm finally doing the the blocking. But uh, I did a light, I just the PPs? Thought, yeah, what's that? The yes, PPs? right, the PPs. So good. That's, uh, it's, I, I'm not like a big block guy, but the PPs deserve to get blocked. Yeah, I did see though, I, I forget what it was. Which, you is got an, something... which is annoying because I think that this might be affecting me, you blocking them. Why? Because I think they're coming now into they come... my mentions to talk about you. Really? Yes. It's happened like a couple times this week. 
I, I floated out there. That there, there was a, a Bruins story going around about which I had a, a little information, so I just I just lightly uh, put that out there on on the Twitter. And uh, one of the one of my people quote tweeted with like, "Oh, so Deej has sources now." LOL. And I was like, "That's how I know that you're like 13 years old." Because <laughs> yeah. like, not to say that I'm like a that I'm Adam Schefter over here, but like, you that were on once the upon Bruins a time beat. like was my contribution to Twitter. Right. I used to actually put like information right. out into the world, and then I became a crazed man tweeting about the Eagles. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so you just outed yourself as very young, you goober. That's that shit doesn't really bother me anymore. It's and like this would bother me because this is what's happening to you. The same people over and over and over and over again, like beating the same drum of negativity towards you or towards me. That's what bothers me because that's like. Like, you, I'm occupying space in your brain, and you're, like, literally devoting energy to being an asshole. Yeah, and generally, I just mute, so I don't see it anyway. Uh, but there's two... Nah, well, there's there's one kid who um, is, like, an aspiring sports writer, and he'll, like, do that sort of stuff with me and with a bunch of other members of the media. And I think I replied to him or I, don't, I can't remember if i dm'd him or what and i was like hey man like i i get it like you you, you gotta hate me or whatever but like sincerely i would just like keep that shit off twitter man like it's like if you're trying to get like jobs and stuff and any newsroom that you apply to is going to look at your tweets and be like oh well they hate everyone who works here Let's not hire this person. Yeah, fam uh, famously, I never picked any fights with with sports writers when I was coming up. Oh yeah, I mean, I've uh, <laughs> I, I I've I've thought about that. Where I mean, it, it it's something that I do look back on and be like, uh, yeah, I probably didn't need to do that. But it's it's also like I think when you're young and you're like hungry and you see people that do have success or whatever oh, and yeah. that you don't think that are necessarily deserving of it, it makes you angry, it makes you bitter, and it makes you like. Like oh I'm gonna I'm gonna dunk on him for like f to be I I don't know to like be an asshole or to like to get people on my side or whatever like dude I used to listen to the Big Show when I was a kid and they'd be like oh well they've got uh, these two prospects they've got the the Johns they've got uh, John Papelbon and John Lester and uh, Papelbon's a, a lefty and Lester's a righty and I'd be like oh. Oh, see, this is why they shouldn't be on the radio because I read the prospect handbook and Lester's the lefty, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, the next five minutes, my mom in the car would have to hear about, like, I don't care how these guys get their jobs, blah, blah, blah. Like, meanwhile, these guys are slogging around a fucking boring ass Red Sox clubhouse for hours at a day. Like, God forbid. That is, like, that is get, like, one percent, one percent of their job. Yeah. Which, God, I mean, I'm thinking back on my reporting days. I, I remember one time I was at a bar with Feidelberg, and he was like, uh, how does so-and-so look? And I was like, I don't even know who that is. Yeah. And it's like about, this is a person I mean, that's, that's that like, like I cover. The biggest thing, too, that, that like I've learned in the past, in like maturing and, and getting a little bit deeper is that like, I, I don't have to know fucking everything. Yeah. And... When I don't know something, just fucking admit it, because oh, not yeah. everybody knows everything, and you're gonna look more stupid if you pretend like you know, and then you get proved wrong. There are so many people I feel like that are in like the media that will refuse to admit that they don't know something, or refuse to admit that when they're wrong or if they're wrong, and it just makes them look so much worse. I respect somebody somebody so much more when they're just like. Ah, yeah, I fucked that up. Or like, ah, yeah, no no idea. Like, ask this person. A very nice compliment I received, and I don't know if it, if they, like, read my diary of, like, hey, here's just what I want people to think of me. But a compliment <laughs> I received in a work, uh, a potential work flirtation thing was they were like, we like that you don't pretend to know what you don't know, but you're thoughtful. So if as long as you're interested in that conversation yeah you're gonna be very engaged in it and you're going to ask questions yeah that that's fill the thing in whoever's listening and like, you can still be entertaining and be like valuable about shit you don't know yeah you just have to like 
acknowledge that you don't know it and right. like be curious. And that's why like we've probably been bad for each other at points, but also good for each other where we used to love leaning into. And this, this was when it was the, the podcast was like more of a, a, a comedy podcast. But and like we'd be popular. Like, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> but like we'd be like, we don't know this. So let's talk as confidently yeah. and just like make stuff up. Well, that's where I don't think anybody knows. Yeah, right. Came from. Right. Like there's <laughs> when no we way didn't know something, we'd just be like, oh, I don't think anybody knows. And now we're like, okay, let's look it up and actually try to learn about it. Uh, never get old, kids. But um, so that's that. That's the menu. I'll say like <laughs> while we're talking about friendship and whatnot, I might on the Patreon uh, release our DMs of late because our DMs have gotten just uh because i talked on a recent episode of my uh targeted instagram oh, content yeah. is just chaotic just really really weird memes and i just send them all to pete as soon as i see one i send it to pete and now pete's been sending me memes back and now all we do is just message each other <laughs> memes and i think it's it's great because last week on the episode i was like man i'm really jealous of your algorithm giving you deranged shit and since you've just been sending me all your deranged shit, I'm getting more deranged Good. shit. Good. So it's like, like everything else in the fucking world, in the history of our relationship, I'm just like siphoning shit off you, regardless of whether it's positive or uh, negative. Right, or whether you want to be. <laughs> right. Yeah. My favorite meme so far is uh, her. Do these jeans make me look fat? Me. Do you promise not to get mad no matter what I say? Her. Yes, me. And then it's like, I don't know anything about anime, but like the like the Charger social media does a lot of anime stuff. Yeah. And it always makes me laugh, even though I don't get the reference. I'm like almost positive that Ken Jack runs this Charger social media. He could, man. Have <laughs> yeah. I told you about like the my Reddit my Chargers Reddit experience? No. I'll go on there and there'll be something like really good on there, like really smart, informative, and I'll be like, huh. That's good. And I'll go to send it to Ken Jack. And as I'm doing like the copy link right next to it, it says who the post is. And it's like LCP Ken Jack. Really? Because it's just like, like Ken Jack's one of like nine people who post on the Chargers <laughs> Reddit. That's amazing. And I'm one of like 1,000 who reads it. Um, I, I, I'm like falling in love with the Chargers fan base, I think, because it's it, the best, it is the absolute most mentally ill fan base in the NFL. And it's just like, like in a fun way, We're like there are mentally like, ill fan bases elsewhere, but like yeah. in a like a really like I don't want to be around them. This is like mentally ill, super online Chargers. No, nah, man, like and, and like we're all kind of green because the Chargers Reddit will be like two days ago. Someone will post like, hey, so how do the Chargers get into the playoffs? Or like, hey, so we're the five seed now. Do we stay in the five seed? Whereas, like, Patriots fans would be like, oh, my, if you don't know the imaginations of blah, 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 blah. So it's just very refreshing to see people being like, it's hey, I hope like, the team does well. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like like Americans trying to get into soccer for the first time. Yeah. Where they're like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in this. How does this work? Yeah. So the, uh, that's cool. The payoff of that meme, by the way. So it's uh, her, do these jeans make me look fat? Me, do you promise not to get mad no matter what I say? Her, yes. And then it's some, like anime skeleton guy like screaming to the heavens and it says i smoked crack after work and sold the car <laughs> again like we're starting to say unhinged too much these days but that is an unhinged yeah, meme. it's the best um what you should do for patreon at the end of the week is just like do like a recap of DJ's unhinged memes. Yes. And and then just like just go through them one by one. Do I like green screen it? Yeah. Or what? or just do like a two box. Nice. I got the uh, I got a new camera, by the way. Hell yeah. Uh to which Tommy Giles was like, Why? You starting an OnlyFans? And I was like, if I could, it like I, I've never uh used OnlyFans or anything like that. Yeah. And hopefully and I, I'm very ignorant when it comes to OnlyFans, but it sounds like OnlyFans is like a great business. Yeah, I mean like it's a creators it's a creators platform. Right. Like it's like a it's another version of Patreon. Yeah, ba basically and like OnlyFans did start as like for like artists. Yeah. And then they were like, "Oh, make a lot more money and like be a lot more like popular if we allow explicit content." 
Yeah, we're going to do that. I mean, everybody has a price. <laughs> yeah. That's all and I'm I saying. mean, it's gotten a lot of people rich. So, yeah. I mean, uh, the OnlyFans discourse or like, blah, 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 like, like demeaning OnlyFans is so stupid. Like, I think that is an incredible side hustle. Yeah, as long or as like, it's for a lot of people, it's their fucking main hustle, which is equally as awesome. I mean, if you make that your hustle and then make whatever your passion is, your like say we just wanted to do this podcast and there was a way that with minimal work we could make ourselves quite well off. Mm -hmm. That it honestly didn't matter how much money this podcast made. Guess what would happen? This podcast would start making a shitload of money because it would be all we did. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. how, God, that's how America works. Yeah. Right? And I mean, like, the 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 American dream has really shifted from what it used to be to, like, making as much money with as little effort as possible. Yeah. Like, and being your own boss mm -hmm. and just doing what else, whatever else you want to do. And, like, OnlyFans has allowed a lot of people to do that. So, like, congrats on living the American dream. Yeah. Uh, Patreon.com slash listen to brunch. We have and OnlyFans.com yeah. slash brunch. We, uh, we have a bonus episode from last week. But uh, also, while I'm... And I've been keeping busy. I actually have had uh, things to, to do this week. But if there are, like, small things that I can do up there that... Uh, and I, I don't like doing like brunch stuff uh, without peep. And I remember one time uh, somebody wanted me to just quickly explain something I was talking about when I said that uh, you get what you give by the new radicals did a certain thing musically. And I just did like a five minute video explaining that if you have any shit like that, that isn't too time consuming. I'm happy to put stuff like that on the Patreon or release the DMs. Yeah. And or... I mean, like I know that you said in the past, so like, that you don't like doing brunch stuff without me, but like that stuff is like an extension of brunch. Yes, and I don't have like a problem with that. Like your 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 Friday streams back when oh, were yeah. that I was do those that again. was a lot of fun, yeah. and like a lot of the questions were about brunch. Yeah, so like it's still an extension of brunch. So the more that we can do stuff like that, I think it's totally fine. Shoot, should I bring back the Friday streams? You probably should. I mean, they were a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll just do that and not hype it up too much on twitter or anything um i'll just make that uh yeah do you twitch.com what am i am i brave uh twitch.com twitch.tv twitch.tv slash brave dave bean slash brave dave bean and uh i'll do i mean there's a few things i can i can do on there as i said uh thank you to brunch for uh buying me a new camera mm -hmm. which is nice Thank you to Brunch for helping Pete. Uh, Pete just got a yeah, Mondo burger of a computer. <laughs> a monster computer. Uh, so that's, that's I got a, I, thank you to Brunch for helping me buy the brand new computer, but also. To clarify, Brunch could not cover that computer. No, it could no. only help. <laughs> yeah, just a small chip away. Yeah, um, paid the tax on that computer. <laughs> Uh, it is funny. I used my uh, my credit card to buy the computer, mm -hmm. and like I looked at my credit card statement, and I got like uh, an absurd amount of cash back oh, like, nice. from just the just the purchase. I thought you were like, I have like thirty dollars left <laughs> to my limit. <laughs> no, uh, but also the uh, the old computer is going to go downstairs into uh, a studio. Yeah, that we are we are gonna build very soon. So. Uh, we, we're doing video now and it's like very basic we're we've kind of like tried to figure out ways to to make this look better yeah but really we're gonna commit to like a, a studio downstairs so uh that computer will go down there and then if you subscribe to patreon maybe you'll help pay for other stuff in the in the new studio hopefully coming very shortly here's this spitballing and this is kind of meta because there's an obvious joke to be made off this what if I did a bad ideas stream? Because famously, this brain is always firing off ideas, and uh, I lean on you and Nora to tell me whether something is a good idea or whether something is an idea that like you'd like to pursue or that can be refined into something better. Uh, I have so many bad ideas <laughs> or like so many ideas that like die on the vine or whatever. Yeah. Uh, like I, text, I can confirm. <laughs> yeah. 
I texted Wayne the other day a picture of uh, it was a screen grab of uh, me writing a play version, like a musical version of the Eagles documentary. Okay. So like it's the Eagles documentary. Did you ever watch that? No. It, seriously, as I have no. I have no. You don't need to. I, I promise you. I, is, I just have zero like knowledge of the Eagles. I know Don Henley's in the Eagles, and I know that he sues everybody. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Believe me, you get to that. In okay. it. But I mean, so uh, long story short. What's what's the famous Eagles song? Hotel California? Hotel California. Okay. Take it easy. Okay, yeah, yeah. Take I it to this. the limit. Okay. Uh, they have many, many hits, but like they just hated each other. Okay. Like Poison. And... No, not like they hate each other, like the band Poison hated each other. <laughs> okay, right? yeah. Poison... Like the... Uh, uh, poison me daddy yes okay um shout out phantom thread also oh my god what a picture yep. a quick apology we'll talk about it in a minute quick apology to paul dano i think i'm coming all the way around on you know what yeah of course paul dano's good <laughs> yeah. what a fucking uh, you were talking earlier about like you used to go after sports writers and say this stuff. i was thinking i was like how many people work for espn that at some point or like ESPN Ugh. and then they're like they get to ESPN and they're like oh yeah like this is this is good I have like made it <laughs> yeah. you know I would love to keep like a, a track keep track of like who we've besmirched or who we've doubted and then like a couple of years late because it's happened several times over the course of this podcast where either we've liked somebody or we've doubted somebody and then had to do like a 180 on it yeah 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 for sure uh, but the <laughs> Eagles documentary is like one of the best documentaries okay. you'll watch and, uh, directed by Paul Dano. Yes. Uh, and people who have seen it, like Wayne and I have it memorized mm -hmm. like word for word. We are sitting around Big his shock. apartment, just uh, like quoting it to each other, giggling, making references. And I, th I, I, there are a lot of people like that. Like I bet that Jim Murray probably has that shit memorized too. So I just from memory, I just started to write out like if this were a stage play, if you made a if you turn a documentary into a play, but you're still kind of presenting it like a documentary. Yeah. You have like older version, like an old Glenn Fry talking about something as a young Glenn Fry is singing "Take It Easy," and then like cuts the Don head, like all this shit. Uh, that's a bad idea, and that's not going to happen. That's yeah. not going to be made. It's not going to get executed. And if it did, guess what happens? Don Henley sues. <laughs> it's true. I will say though, like f from my my perspective, it's better than like eighty percent of the ideas that you have you have sent me. <laughs> You're like, yeah, there's like a stage. Like, I don't I don't necessarily get it, but it sounds like a cool thing that I might be interested in. But if there's like what if, the, if there's like a stream of me working on that play or like <laughs> casting that play or doing whatever, just ideas that aren't Flesh, going to like fleshing out bad ideas just for the sake of it. Fle and I, I mean. Look, for every one of those, there's a tomato fights, which, right. I mean, Sean Evans right now is still going on about what a good idea that is. <laughs> what do you think of the, this concept for a podcast? I actually, I, I love it. And then here, uh, this is not to gas you guys too much, but like I was telling some other people that I'm going on this podcast and like, oh, what's the podcast? And they're like, oh, well, they take two movies that have the exact same Rotten Tomatoes score. And then it's kind of a debate about which movie is better. And 100% of the time, people are like, Whoa, that's a cool idea. That's no. a good podcast. To be fair, a lot of good ideas start out as bad ideas. Oh, definitely. And then that's, they just get workshopped. Right. That's, I mean, that's idea in 101. You just sit with somebody, throw something out there. And even if you say, I have no idea how this would work, but I'm thinking of something where this happens. And then someone asks you two, three questions about it. And then you have an idea. And you start. Also, I just. <laughs> I just noticed that your hat. Have you had that for a long time? Forever. Do it look like I'm left off bad and bougie? Uh, R.I.P. When I was at Dunks, the guy uh, preparing my coffee asked if my hat said what he thought it said. And I said, <laughs> oh, it sure does. I said, do you get the reference? And he laughed. He said, yes. And I <laughs> that's said, awesome. I said, poor DJ Academics. Yeah. And he no, said, That's not always. the takeoff there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not the takeaway there. I mean, poor other people involved right, for exactly. sure. Um let's talk The Fablemans. The Fablemans, directed by Steven Spielberg, 
is a loosely autobiographical coming-of-age film based around the fictional Sammy Fableman, a Jewish kid who moves around as a kid and develops a keen affinity for filmmaking in the 1960s. His developing prowess plays off a complicated family dynamic as he grows into a young man. Once again, nailed the synopsis. No one does it like me. This is a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, has an 82 uh, audience score. It's a long movie. Cheers. Two hours and 31 minutes. First, before we get into whether we liked it, did that get to you at all? The length of this movie? Yeah, so it's it was sort of like my biggest aversion to uh, to seeing it before I saw it. Uh, it's just kind of overwhelming. Um, and I, I, I thought that it would probably be good considering everybody involved. But it also, from the trailer, seemed very, um, I don't know, what do you want to call it? Like Oscars baity? Oh yeah. So I had like I had preconceived aversions to it and the the runtime was one of them. This is a Steven Spielberg love letter to Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. So that would for sure be Oscar's Beatty. It stars Michelle Williams, Paul Dano, Seth Rogen, Gabriel Labelle in the lead as a young Sammy Fableman. Uh Jeannie Berlin, the great Amazing. Julia Butters. Amazing yeah. in this movie. Yeah. Uh the the the, the always great Julia Butters. Judd Hirsch, speaking of amazing in this movie, really among others, I loved the cast in this movie. There, there was nary a bad performance, really kind of as always of late, blown away by Michelle Williams. This is definitely going to be uh, Best Supporting Actress nominee material. I love this movie. I thought this movie was Awesome. I'll shoot my wad and say four and a half on Letterbox. Like, mm. really, really love this movie. It's four and a half for me, too. Uh, I, I really, really, really liked it. I don't know if I'm willing to say that, like, I loved it, but it was an awesome experience and, like, just a really well done movie front to back. The, even the runtime, two hours, 31 minutes, I, I would have taken more. I yeah. legitimately would have taken more. And when it ended, I was like, Oh damn. Yeah. Like it it is fully like enthralling start to finish. This obviously every year there's a great coming of age film whether it's Boyhood, uh uh Lady Bird, mid 90s. I mean Call Me By Your Name is coming of age-ish. I mean so so many uh, licorice pizza last year this is this year's like def definitive coming of age film, and I think the kid uh, Gabriel Labelle was awesome was in great. it, especially yeah. in like his high school years. He was, it was a little distracting. I've I've said it when we watched Dawson's Creek that like okay we get it Joshua Jackson you've seen George Clooney act and you're trying to be like George Clooney. There were points in this movie where I was like. Yeah, buddy, you've seen Andrew Garfield. <laughs> he, but I mean, if you can do the Andrew Garfield thing, then... I thought you were gonna say like, like, yeah, buddy, we get it. Like you're young Steven Spielberg. Oh, because no. there, there was elements of that too for me where it was like, all right, this kid, all right, we get it. Like this kid, like r is really into directing. Yeah, but like it, it obviously is part of the story, and there are a lot of reasons why you would maybe think that you would be annoyed by this movie, and one of them being, you know it being Steven Spielberg's love letter to himself, as you mentioned, but it's all the characters are, are pretty likable. Like it's it, even for a love letter, it's not obnoxious. It's not like super self-indulgent. It's, it really lends itself to a good story. The, the character of Mitzi played by Michelle Williams is just incredible. And she's so good in it. I, I don't, you know I don't like the word underrated because it's usually placed on very, very successful and like well compensated and awarded people. But somehow I feel like Michelle Williams is underrated. She's great in all these. I mean, speaking of coming of age uh, films, Manchester by the Sea, incredible in that. I would say underrated to the general public. Yeah. Like if, if, if you ask the general public, most of them are not going to say M Michelle Williams is like one of the best actresses in Hollywood. Right. And but if she you ask, for sure is. if you ask movie people, they yeah. will say Michelle Williams. She's so, so, so good in this. 
Paul Dano is great in this. Paul Dano, who is a candidate for this year's Michael Stuhlbarg slash Octavia Spencer Award, is someone who is good in multiple things this year. He, like a lot of people who are up for that award this year, was also in The Batman. Colin Farrell's going to be coming for that ass as well. Uh, Barry Keoghan's going to be coming for that ass. Although, can we give it to Barry Keoghan when he was in like one second of The Batman? (laughs) Is Is that a joke? Right? He's only in it yeah, for a second, you, right? He's like barely in it. You can barely see him. He's, I mean... He's in the shadows. He's spo- may contain the Batman spoiler. Uh, he's Joker. the Joker, yeah, right? Yeah, correct, yeah. So it'd be tough to give it to him. Yeah. But man, I want to give that were... kid so many awards yeah. for Banshees. Anyway. I, uh, um, I, I, I think it's interesting. Like Paul Dano, I've always thought that Paul Dano was pretty good. We're reaching a point where Paul Dano is maybe like the most versatile actor in Hollywood because this year he played like what I, what I interpreted as young Riddler, Mm -hmm. like a young Riddler, a young man. Yeah. And now in the Fablemans, he plays like an old dad. Yeah. And he's 38 years old. He plays a guy in this movie who I would interpret as being like, 40s yeah maybe 50 at some point like and he nails it he 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 comes off as like an old guy but he can also play a young guy like it, it's wild where he is in his career where he can do both things there's also something about the character in his face that just yeah for right. some it's reason round is very 60s yeah 100 you know? it's why i think it's why he was good in uh love and mercy the brian wilson movie like even though he doesn't really look like brian wilson it was he. He was just more convincingly '60s than anybody else. The other people looked like they were in costume. Well, he he does seem to have like an old soul. Yeah, and he's always seemed that way. So it's not that surprising that he would be like a sort of like a time capsule of a human. <laughs> uh, can we talk about Julia Butters for a minute? Yes, because she doesn't have a huge role in this movie, but she has one scene after a major family event where it's just her and the Sammy character mm-hmm. and. Goodness gracious, we talked about with the whale that you don't hold it against the kid who plays the missionary that like Sadie Sink dominates him in a scene or something like that. This kid, Gabriel Abel, who I thought was awesome in this movie, is just getting worked by Julia Butters. I mean, if there is anybody that I would be more confident is like a shoe in to be a fucking star yeah. in like four or five years. Even right now, man. It's I mean, Steven Spielberg put you in a movie. And speaking of, and I, I apologize for making that Julia Butters you got discussion. Tar- you got so Tarantino short. and Spielberg being like, "Fuck yeah!" If I had to, uh, if I had to place a bet on somebody to in four or five years, as you just said, be a star. It is. Let me find this kid's name. Uh, Isabel Kussman, the kid from Licorice Pizza, who is the girlfriend of the bully in high school in this movie the friend of sammy's girlfriend you know what i'm talking about i think her i think so the uh the blonde girl she i I think she's got a blonde but she uh, she's just uh, something in her face and the way that she carries herself just really gives me um young who did i oh like young kate bosworth I yes, could see her yes, kind of yeah, being... yeah. And like I was even watching the Fablemans, I was waiting for her to have like a bigger role just because she has that look and has that demeanor where you're like, that's that's somebody important. That that's a good way to put it. She's got like a star's demeanor. So and I look, I've incorrectly heard songs and been like, this will be the song of the summer, and then it's not even released as a, as a single. But like well, it's like when some people like identify an it girl, they're yeah. like, you just don't know, like, you don't know why, but you're drawn to that person. Yeah. She has the it girl factor. Honestly, like maybe I like, uh, um, like, uh, uh, why can't I think of her name? Like Emma Stone in uh, Superbad, where you're just like, I feel like we're probably not done with you. Yes, you yeah, know, yeah. That's that. That's what I thought with this actor and uh, in this character. I also think we're not done with Gabriel Abel. I think that that no, kid I mean, is going to famously your career usually doesn't die soon after Steven Spielberg is like, yeah, I want you in my movie. 
I thought you were going to say, famously, your career doesn't die after a Steven Spielberg movie. Takes over your movie. And I was going to say, tell that to Dick Richards, which <laughs> yeah, right. brings us to my biggest issue with this movie. Massive Dick Richards erasure in this movie, because it does not lead up to him getting his first directing gig and the explanation why. We would never do this, but I was thinking, I was like, yeah. man, we should really uh, shoot a supplemental scene for this movie that uh, is the two producers of the movie being like what are we going to do about this movie i heard the director keeps calling the shark a whale <laughs> i'm very glad that they didn't do that because that that deserves its own movie and the idea of doing a whole ass movie about dick richards calling the shark a whale yeah is just i mean it's the funniest thing that's ever happened in the history of humanity but Doing a full-on movie about that would be so fucking funny. All right. And I want to put... Uh, Seth Rogen should be in it somehow. Here's a bad idea that I will execute. Uh, a movie called The Whale that <laughs> is the end of the Dick Richards tenure as director of Jaws. Yes. It's a, it'll be... A, think of it as... Here's my sales Wh pitch. You, the Whale with an asterisk. Yeah. It's the disaster artist... Yes, jobs. yes, exactly. That's exactly what was in... I was thinking Disaster Artist when I was like, well, one thing, a, a movie on this one thing that like is so stupid that it's incomprehensible, the Disaster Artist version of Jaws would be hilarious. Okay, so do I write it as a movie or do I write it as a short film? Because if I write it as a short film, we could actually make it. Maybe we, you start to, maybe it's like Whiplash. It starts as a short film yes. and people are like... That's what we what need to do to it? get our YouTube channel off the ground. Yes. Yeah. The Whale, yeah. in parentheses, 2023. Yes. They're like, actually, it came out of, ooh, who are these people? <laughs> they don't, they're not acting well. <laughs> All right, that's The Fablemans. Four and a half stars on Letterboxd. No, I, will, I will say The Fablemans, like, it is, it looks spectacular. Uh, it's a great story. It's got a lot of good messaging. Um, there are, like, extremely uh human characters and it is time to start asking is steven spielberg a good director i'll do you one better i was taken by the score in this movie Ooh. and 91 percent on rotten tomatoes i'll be no, yes yeah, that <laughs> score and i'll be damned if i'm not going to check out this john williams fellow oh yeah so we're in on this movie. A lot of newcomers in this movie. That's right. And of the newcomers, we're most impressed by Steven Spielberg and John Williams. So look for big things in uh, in their career. Yeah, man. I like that movie. All right. You want to talk about After Sun as well? Oh, shit. Just I a didn't... little bit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we'll talk about After Sun, and I'll feel bad that the YouTube people uh, don't get to hear me uh, give uh, Judd Hirsch his flowers because... He was in it for a little bit, and he made it count. Uh, he absolutely made it count. And, I mean, there is this thing called editing, so we could put it in the end. No, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, but Judd Hirsch, I didn't realize that that was Judd Hirsch, and I don't know how much I know about Judd Hirsch. Mm. Is he Emil Hirsch's father? Oh, if so, that'd be crazy. Let's but Judd see. Hirsch, at the end of that movie, was riveting. Like, riveting. No, absolutely. no, no. Judd Hirsch is, uh, Judd Hirsch is the... Uncle. Oh, also very riveting. Yeah. Also very riveting. But whoever played the guy at the end of that movie was fucking incredible. Yes. Who, uh, it was, uh, you played John Ford. Let's see. Oh, it was David Lynch. Oh, right. Of course it was fucking right. riveting. Right. I knew he looked familiar, but I couldn't figure out who. God damn, he was incredible. At the, I mean, at the he end of that was movie. like drowning in cigar smoke. Yes, so it was, it was so tough to, good. to be able to tell who is who there. Um, but let us discuss After Sun. Directed by Charlotte Wells, it sees Sophie reflect on a vacation with her loving, not always there father from her adolescence some 20 years later. Her father, the charming and handsome Callum, is every bit as lost in life as she is, making for an emotional journey as the viewer joins Sophie in trying to appreciate an imperfect relationship. Good synopsis there? Yeah, very good. Great and synopsis. also 22, 2022, huge year for uh, guys named Colm who are just lost and in very depressing movies. That's right. Colm famously played by Brendan Gleeson 
in the Banshees of Inisherin. This is a 96% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and a 79 audience score. Got to ask audiences? the audience to get a life because yeah, this is a fantastic movie. It obviously does, as you mentioned, stay with the very popular theme of sad dude movies this year. Banshees, The Whale, Jackass Forever. Toss this right <laughs> in there. Just sad dudes dudes doing uh, sad dude things. As I mentioned, this was directed by Charlotte Wells, but I got huge Sean Baker vibes off of it. Who's Sean Baker? The Florida Project, yeah, yeah, Red yeah. Rocket, mm -hmm. that okay. sort of thing. Yeah. And maybe it's because it had such a vacation-y setting and was kind of grim. And it's, but, and it's like hyper-focused. Yes. I also loved this movie. Yeah, I, I really love this movie. And A24, by the way. Of, so, of course, we loved it. Uh, but 2022, big year for depressing movies, but big year for just, like, examining human character. And, like, I think that's – those things go hand in hand sometimes. Yeah. Uh, this movie is really, really great at um, depression, like, shining a light on depression. Yeah, and the thing of um, – just understanding that a lot of things can be true at the same time. Like the character of Colm, he's 30-something, uh, not happy with his lot in life, ultimately not doing well, even though he's got a beautiful, healthy daughter. Um, he's not married to the, uh, to the mother of this child. He's on vacation with her. And although he clearly loves his daughter... And he, is good to his daughter yeah, for, for the most part, yeah. He does not like being a father and probably wasn't cut out to be a father. And I think that's something that I think a lot of non-parents, if they don't think about it, I don't know, maybe they should or maybe this is like a common worry. Like, hey, what if I wouldn't be a good parent? Or like, what if you have the kid, there's a Don Draper monologue of like, the baby comes out, you hold it. You look at it and you know you're supposed to feel something and you don't and you hate yourself for it. And then one day, like five years later, something happens and suddenly you get it. Like that sort of grim but also like kind of believable thing because you mm -hmm. learn from things like love or friendship or whatever that – your what you're initially taught about life it's not isn't always, as clean. Yeah, it's yeah. not always it not always as like very clear cut as what you're told it is sometimes. Yeah. So you're rooting for this guy and you're rooting for this kid to have like a better time, but also you're like, fuck, this is not a clean relationship no. at all. I my takeaway though wasn't like he doesn't like being a father. Like that wasn't my takeaway. It was just that like he has this like has a pretty good relationship with his daughter. Like there's shared love there. They're good to each other. But like this guy still clearly, clearly has like a hole in his like spiritual existence. And yeah. he is very unfulfilled and very unhappy with his life. Yeah. I didn't come away being like, oh, he he wishes he wasn't her father or something. I don't think that he necessarily actively wishes I, I i think though that he thinks he shouldn't be a father and that whatever he's doing and where he is isn't where he's supposed to be mm -hmm. and he's more kind of wondering how we got there versus yeah where do i go from here and that's the thing like i think a lot of people get that when they're down in the dumps like they don't actually think through where do i go from here they just think like well what the fuck is this and why am i here versus okay What's my next step? I think that he very much feels stuck. He doesn't have a lot of money. He knows that he's not going to be the best dad because he's not always emotionally present there. And there are so many great scenes between the two characters that uh, that show that. In the scene where she's asking him where... I think she's 11, I believe, and she says... Uh, when you like, all right, so you're 35 or whatever. When you were 11, what did you think you'd be doing at 35? And he's like, yo, turn that camera off yeah. right now. And I think that's like, you could ask most pe like 35 year olds or 29 year olds that or whatever, and they'd feel the same way because you think, okay, well, at this point, I'll have everything figured out. And what you learn as you get older is you're never going to have everything figured out and you're never going to totally feel 
like you're nailing it unless uh, you have an unhealthy relationship with uh, with yourself. So there is just so many good scenes between these two characters. The one that like really hit me the most was like the there they, there was like uh, a sequence where like they had a really good day and everything seemed to be like wow this vacation's going well and he goes up to the hotel room by himself and just has like a complete breakdown and like just starts crying on the bed and like that's the point where you're like oh man like it doesn't matter what goes right for this guy in like small moments or whatever like at the end of the day he's going back to like be with himself and that is not comfortable for him yeah i mean he tells a stranger that he wants to die at what point i don't remember that when they're uh i think it's they're scuba diving and uh he's talking to a guy, the guy that works there and he says like hey so uh what brings you here and he said well i lived here and then i traveled around the world and everything but then you know what i just found that as much as i loved traveling i loved home more and now i'm whatever age and uh he says uh He's like, and then I'll be 30 or whatever. And he sa- and then Colm says, uh, I can't see myself ever being 40. Yeah. And then he yeah, says, right. like, I forgot about that. To be honest, I didn't see myself uh, yeah. hitting 30. And you're like, fuck, you just met that dude. Mm-hmm. God. Um, th- I mean, th- there's also the karaoke scene, which is yeah devastating, but also has such good dialogue that... That's where it feels very Sean Bakery, where it's like, this makes me feel horrible, but I'm also so impressed by everything that I'm seeing. The uh, the line of, uh, she goes, they're doing karaoke, and she signs them up to sing a song together, and he won't go up it's like because he's sitting there drinking by himself, and he's just hating yeah. life. And uh, so she sings by himself, and she's calling him up, and he's just sitting there acting like he doesn't know her. And she comes back and he says, you know, we could get you singing lessons uh, so you can learn to sing. And she says, you tell me I can't sing? He says, no, I'm just saying that anyone can learn if they put in the work. She says, stop doing that. Doing what? Offering to pay for something when I know you don't have the money. That's such a good, like, yeah, you just fucking killed me up there. Yeah. I'm going to hit you where it hurts, poor boy. Yeah. And like... All around great performances in this movie too. Yeah, uh, Paul Mescal, uh, yes, extremely, extremely good. Uh, Frankie Corio plays Sophie Patterson. Yeah, um, and she is really, really great in this as well. Yeah, I just a, a really great movie. Probably is not going to be for everybody. Like I would say, you know, you know, to the to the Florida Project uh, comparison, like that's not a movie that everybody's going to love either. Right. It's it's. I would say. Would you say it's like fair to call this movie like a vignette? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas for sure. like where like the Florida Project, like it's not going to tell a complete story. It's going to highlight a specific thing mm-hmm. and like its importance to somebody's life. Right. And I think that that's very cool. And it I mean, it skips ahead to a kind of predictable spot, mm-hmm. but it explains why that trip would be so important to that person and why they always be thinking about it. And it it. explains like the, like basically the importance of the movie. Yeah. Like, yeah, right. Like why this movie is being made and why it's, why it's being highlighted. So I gave it a 4.5. Would you, would you give it? I would. Yeah. So I mean, I do it based on like eighties, nineties and it's, it's absolutely in the nineties for me. So I give it four and a half stars. Yeah. This would be like, if, if we did it out of a hundred, this would be like 93 ish yeah. for me. And I'm trying to not go to, I'm not trying to break 90 for just anyone, but this is like for sure a top five movie, uh, I saw in 2022. I think that, uh, I tried to order my 2022 favorites and I'd say that, I think I had it at uh, third. Is that right? Yeah, but behind Banshees and uh, Everything Everywhere all at once, which might be a little high, but it's a great, great movie. Yeah, let me see. I uh, yeah, I mean, like I have it. So right now, four and a half for me, 
is like a little bit crowded. I only have two five stars. I have Top Gun, Maverick, and Banshees mm-hmm. are my two five stars. And then um, Everything Everywhere All at Once, Barbarian, After Sun, The Fablemans, The Whale, RRR, and The Weird Al movie are all four and a half for me. Oh, I'm an idiot. I found uh, that, that that was not my list. That was just me listing the movies I'd seen. Here's my <laughs> list. Banshees, Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Whale, Top Gun, Maverick, RRR, After Sun. So, okay. And then Barbarian right after it. Shut up, Barbarian. You haven't seen that one. You are loco. I would feel... I, I, if After Sun, I think, cracks my top five right now. It may get the bump. Um, but, like, if, based on what I've seen to this point, like, it's absolutely in the best picture uh, conversation. I hope so. I hope so. I also want to uh, wrap up while we're talking about movies. Um, there was a great but also scary tweet uh, last week from, I believe, a movie writer for The Ringer who said, I swear to God, if uh, Austin Butler gets an Oscar before Colin Farrell. And I was like, oh, shit, that is possible. God. And a lot of people were like, and I took it more as like, that would be so terrible if Colin Farrell loses to somebody who gave an inferior performance. But then I saw a lot of the responses to it were comparing Austin Butler to Rami Malek. And I was like, wait, wait a second. We don't think that Austin Butler was bad. No. Like, Austin Butler was good. And I'll be honest with you. Like, if Austin Butler wins, regardless of who it's over, I'm not going to be... I'm not going to be upset because Austin Butler was great. Yeah, I think he, he gave, was like the the like the biggest redeeming thing about that movie, which I did not like very much. Right, he was an Oscar nom worthy performance, and in a bad year, I wouldn't bat an eye at at him winning. Like the, I, I can understand why people would make the Rami Malek comparison because it's like a, a pretty good actor in a in a bad movie, um, but. And like obviously, like the musical elements, of, it makes it an easy comparison as well. But like, Remy Malik didn't elevate Bohemian Rhapsody. It was still a bad movie, and he wasn't that great. He just wasn't actively bad. So I was annoyed that he won for that because he wasn't great. Yeah, <laughs> and the movie got like a bunch of undeserved praise in my mind. I am not seeing the same praise for Elvis. But I am seeing a lot of praise for Austin Butler, which is deserved because he did elevate Elvis. That movie probably would have been worse with somebody else in that role because he was really, really good and really impressive for a pretty green actor. Oh, yeah. And we just talked about um, The Menu where like The Menu isn't a great movie, but it's like, hey, you want to go see want to see a good performance? My friend uh, asked me yesterday, uh, I haven't seen The Menu. Should I check it out? He said, Still, yeah, I would recommend it. Didn't love it, but would recommend it. I I said it's not my favorite movie, but if you want to see some really good performances, uh, I I was like, what do you think of Hong Chow? He was like, oh, love Hong Chow. Nicholas Holt's very good. Yeah. Uh, um, And and Taylor Joy, very good. Ralph Fiennes, obviously, always always great. Like, I've seen Ralph Fiennes get like, fuck, damn it, Ray Fiennes. I always fuck that up. Uh, I I mean, it's kind of his fault. Yeah. Spells uh, it R A L T H. <laughs> uh I've seen Ray Fines get like um like love for best actor this year and Yeah not and for me. It's too I feel like that would be too weird because like that I just I feel like that'd be a reputation thing. I, I kinda put that movie at the kids' table a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, maybe that would be kind of lifetime achievement y, but I'll tell you what, and I'm looking forward. I'm keeping a document of uh, I'm I'm taking very seriously the Michael Stuhlbarg slash Octavia Spencer award this year, mm-hmm. and I mean Hong Chow is for sure a nominee. Paul Dano is a nominee. Colin Farrell is a nominee. We have to see the movie Thirteen Souls, by the way. Okay, because uh, he also starred in that in 2022. I. Don't know Are you what talking it Paul is. Dano? No, talking uh, Colin Farrell. Okay, okay. So I mean, I'm always down to watch everything with Colin Farrell. More Farrell, yeah. Have you seen SWAT? I have, yes. I watched SWAT recently. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> that movie's that. That's I love that movie, but once I'm like 25 minutes into it, I'm like, oh, this movie sucks. Yeah, but it's like a nostalgic thing. 
Jeremy Renner is in that movie. Prayers up for the Rem Dog. Yeah, I mean, I just so much respect for Jeremy Renner doing the I lived bitch tweet after yeah. after after uh the his snowplow accident, which is horrifying. A lot of horrifying shit happened last week and let's cut it out, please. Um but we talked about like um I want to say like maybe a month, month and a half ago, like we can admit this is a weak year for movies. Do you still feel that way? Uh, I'm seeing more movies that I quite like uh, more recently. I think that it's a it's a weak year for like the blockbuster. It's a weak year for movies that everybody will like. It's a yeah because I'm recommending movies to like my sisters and they're coming back to me being like, uh, what was that? And I'm like, oh, fair. Even Banshees, which yeah. I I thought like, what's not to like about Banshees? Old but people peop- don't like Banshees. Yeah, I mean, I've seen young people that don't like Banshees or like don't necessarily get it, and it's that's that's disheartening. I, I think that this is a pretty pretty decent year for movies, or it's shaping up to be a pretty decent year for movies. Once like once Oscars roll around, right around the corner, uh, I'm gonna be intrigued by the discussions. The last one that I need to see of stuff that I should have seen by now is uh, Tar. Tar, yeah. That's uh, that's like the the last remaining one I think uh, that has been like this is going to be in the conversation. Right, but I mean, when you think of Best Picture noms, there are enough that although they do ten nowadays, so maybe there, there's probably a bunch that that uh, have yet to be released. But, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be happy with most of them. Yeah, same here. Do you do you think that Top Gun Maverick gets a nomination for yes. Best Picture? You do think so? Yes. Hell uh, yes. I don't... Uh, I also don't think that uh, there is a... What's the cowboy movie? I can't remember. Um, the dog, Power of the Power Dog. Power of the Dog. Like there's, a movie that like that we're going to hate. Right, there's the not thing. going to be a, oh, that fucking guy, are you kidding me, movie? I don't think was there a. a I mean, uh, there might be. You might be surprised. Like, me, I, honestly, I think that if Glass Onion ends up in the Best Picture thing, I'm gonna be like, really. People will treat it the way that they treated um, the uh, Adam McKay end of the world movie. Oh, this is the end. Uh, no. Um, the, shoot. Wow, we're so old. Our brains don't work. What's the fucking movie? With, uh, oh no! This is the end. Don't look the, up. Don't yeah. look up. Yeah, yeah. Oh no! I, I, if if that got nominated, I'd be. Thrilled. No, I know, but I, I think it's funny that I fucking mixed that up. I mean, don't look up. Yeah, it won't. But I would. I hope RRR gets nominated. It won't. Yeah. Although Netflix movies have like kind of crept more into the conversation. Also, was RRR technically? No, I think it was just uh, like early 2022. Oh, became... you're saying like it could have been an old thing that kind of just hit Netflix? Yeah. But uh, it definitely picked up like a secondary wave of momentum. Yeah. So I'm looking at movies that I'm sure that Blonde had aspirations of being like a best picture thing. Blonde was the worst movie I saw this past really? year. It, it and I'd forgotten about it. I when I because uh, Brent Touchable had said like, "Hey, give me some movie. Give us some. Uh, can you guys give me some movie recs?" And I started to just write down all the movies that I saw. And then I saw Ken Jack tweet about how bad Blonde was, and I was like, "I had literally forgot I saw that movie. It was that that was definitely the worst movie I saw okay. this year." But um, I'm trying. I'm looking through the movies and thinking, are any of the movies that I had low going to be nominated to make me really mad? And Blonde's not getting nominated. Um, Don't worry, darling, isn't getting nominated. No. If it did, that would actually be kind of hilarious. I I will. Uh, yeah. Like, at, don't worry, darling, is kind of to the point where we all recognize that it's a bad movie. Like, the only thing that that makes me mad is when like I'm on the on the side of a polarizing movie and I think that it's bad, and then there's uh, like like Bohemian Rhapsody. People thought that Bohemian Rhapsody were was good. Yeah. A lot of people liked that movie. And so when it ended up in like the best, best picture conversation, it made me really mad because there were people defending it. Yeah. I like, don't worry, darling. I don't think too many people are going to defend it. I've got two. Uh, how about the Batman? You think the Batman gets nominated? No, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily like be angry if it did. I would just be like, this is, it would be kind of like a Ford versus Ferrari situation right. where it's like, this is a good movie, but it should not be in yeah. this category. And it's like, Let's be real. It's 
definitely not winning. Yeah, so right. Yeah, I'm like I'm not gonna like get yeah. What am I over? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, that that would be a, a case of like we just simply have too many nominees now. Right. Nope. I think gets nominated. That one, I would be mad if it got if it won. I would right. not be mad if it got nominated because a lot of people like it, and I just don't really get it. And I didn't think that it was a bad movie. Yeah, I just didn't get it. I agree with that, and I need to rewatch it because I see more and more clips now posted from the movie about like, hey, look how brilliant this scene is. And as I watch the isolated clips, I'm like, oh, that's fucking great. And then I'm like, so yeah. is it just that I didn't? Uh, I, I think my, my I think issue no- is nope was that I didn't go in to it thinking like, okay, Jordan Peele's making uh an alien movie that says bigger things than that. If I had gone in with that mindset, I think I would have received it better. Instead, I was like, wait, so what kind of movie is this? And then it was over. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's a chance that I would like it more on a second watch, knowing what it is and knowing how it plays out. But like the first time through, I was waiting for a big final act or a big final twist in the, in the final act, and it just never really came, and that that made it fall flat for me. Mm-hmm. So if I can, if I have that baseline knowledge of like this is the way that it plays out, I can pay attention to those other things more. But still, at the end of the day, I can't see myself loving Nope enough to be like, yeah, best movie of the year. I haven't put this anywhere. I'll put it on the Patreon, but. Um... I'm just going to run down. Want to run down quickly my top 25 movies of 2022? Yeah, like is this in an order? Or, yeah. yeah. So I have 44 movies on this uh, list, although I got to add uh, 45 now. So let's... Uh, there we go. I feel like should we save this and do it as like a more formal like presentation? We can, although this is like a 2022 thing versus necessarily like an Oscars thing. Right, but like even still, I think that might be like a... Yeah, I can save it. Yeah, let's save save it. it? Yeah, let's save it, because I want to do my list too, and we can can get it out there somehow. All right, hope you like that, listeners. You like that? That's a tease, We were like, hey, you want... uh, Got an even better tease. Check out Brunch next week. Uh, It will feature uh, Cameron Dicker of the Los Angeles Chargers. Patreon.com slash listen to brunch. Possibly Friday stream. Who knows? Bye. I hate to say it. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man.